Welcome back, guys. We have a terrific, terrific guest today. Uh, he is a renowned dating coach. You can find him all over YouTube. He is part of Beast Coaching with his partner, How to Beast, and he is also the author of Conversation Casanova, The Lifestyle Blueprint, and several other books. Please welcome Dave Parada to the program. How you doing, Dave? What's going on, man? It's great to be here. This great is, to be over here in Vegas. This is the first time you've done a live uh, podcast before? First time I've done it live. I usually do them on Zoom, but yeah. this time I'm always like in a random part of the world, so for that's sure. why. But now I'm over here in Vegas. Figured, why not? Let's go. For was it. this Let's your go for it, so. was this your first time in Vegas? First time in Vegas. What, what yeah. did you think about Fremont last night? Um, I liked it. It was cool. It was a yeah. good spot. Uh, bounced around a little bit. Still haven't seen really what Vegas is all about. Yeah. It's only I've only been here Monday, Tuesday night, so I'm looking forward to what, to the weekend. To, to me, it's different for everybody, right? For some people, it's the show. Some people, it's the gambling. For me, it's on stage with. Tiesto or or a Dead Mouse or Skrillex or something like to me that explosion is to, is what Vegas is to me but for other people it's a different experience yeah, I mean, when you when you see or or I'm sorry going to the Rhino at 3 a.m. obviously <laughs> or, or Sapphire that's 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 the other thing yeah for sure yeah I mean I see you up here on Insta on the Instagram stories absolutely yeah. killing it always yeah. on stage like hanging out having fun man yeah. so I'm definitely looking for a piece of that looking to looking to enjoy Dude, Vegas tonight well, all right we're, we're Encore Beach Club get ready get ready <laughs> tonight get ready tonight we're taking Dave out of there so let's talk about this uh, it's it's a controversial topic that. That's, that's changed over the course of time. You before uh, it's infield, right? Infield that people were filming on uh, YouTube, right? It's one of these things where I, the first guy I remember ever doing this was Mihao, like a million years ago, right? And then later RSD did it, uh, and then you you've done it too as well. Can you talk about initially how you got into this for, for the, the into this space where you were filming a lot of infield and giving guys advice, and then later on you transit you had to transition out just because of the way the algorithm works on YouTube. Yeah, I mean, so basically how it all started with me even getting into the dating industry was I had my own transformation, right? I was always very, very anxious, always very, um, just very anxious around women, a lot of insecurities, couldn't talk to them, couldn't approach them, couldn't do any of that, decided I didn't want to kind of go through that anymore. I wanted to be a guy who could be confident, who could, you know, roll up to a table of girls, be able to know exactly what I was going to say and do all of that. So I made it sort of my mission when the time, by the time I was like 17, 18 to figure that out. And over the course of like three, four years, going out hard in like 18 plus clubs when I was 18, just like never stopping and then connecting with some really cool guys in Boston who were also going out hitting, hitting it up hard. I started getting really, really good at it. And I realized it was changing my life. It was, it was, I was going from this guy who, you know, went to school for accounting, mm. was like having this corporate background, really not excited about it to a guy who was like, all right, if I could figure out the dating stuff, why not everything else? Why can't I figure out my career in a better way? Why can't I create a lifestyle that I want for myself? So that was that be, kind of became the goal, and I wanted to help other guys have those same realizations as well because it changed everything for me. Is that something you see commonly? Like the trope here in Las Vegas is like the male stripper who's really good with women but sleeps on people's couches. You know what I'm saying? The bartender who can't get his fucking life together, but he's so good with women. Have you you've seen that before, right? I try to tell guys they're like, what what should I work on first? You know, the the money of the women, and my whole thing is. Or success. It's not money or women. It's competency in women. I think that's probably a better way to say it. Uh, that you, like, if if the whim, if the competency's at zero and you're really good with women, eventually, like, you're the dude on the couch, right? You're the dude sleeping on the couch. At some point, you do have to work on both. Do you have a a, a, a part where you're like, okay, man, have you ever had it? What I'm saying is, I've had kids come to me and they're like, I got accepted to Columbia or Harvard or Oxford. I'm gonna skip that so I can travel around the world with pickup artists. And I'm like, bro, let's not do that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I know exactly what you mean. There's definitely something to be said for getting really good with women. And yeah. a lot of times that is a big step in the right direction to getting your life solved. Yeah. But you don't want it to ever just be about getting good with mm. women, right? You want it to be sort of a wholesale change in your, in your life. And that's why a lot of times when I'm coaching guys, it's like, all right, let's get the dating stuff handled. But let's also make sure you're hitting the gym consistently. You have good habits, right? You're, you're continuing to want more out of life rather than just let me go hook up with a bunch of girls and see what can happen. Yeah, it's crazy. Like how, but what what a distraction it is for you when you're younger, right? Yeah, I mean, th there's a time and place for it in your 20s, and I think for me, I kind of had to go through that phase where I was just dating a bunch of girls, traveling around, just like basically being a complete degenerate and, and just enjoying myself. You've you probably had clients who never went through that phase in their 20s. They get to their 30s, they go through their first divorce, and then you realize that they just kind of miss that whole thing. Well, a lot of guys in general will never even come close to experiencing abundance with women. Like right. They'll never even come close to being able to, oh, I'm getting two, three, four dates a week. I have girls hitting me up. I have girls obsessed. Like I have all these things sort of happening in my life. Most guys are going to just sort of marry the girl from their hometown or like the girl from work and they're going to, they know they're kind of settling, but they're like, ah, let's see what kind of happens here. You know, they, they rationalize it. 
Yeah, it is interesting. And then divorce rates go up and you see uh, a, a serious issue with that. I feel like because people get married for the wrong reason or they get married because they're being told to externally to get married. Yeah, no, they, they're counting on the stability of it. They're counting on what their friends are, are mm. doing. Oh, all my friends are getting married. I need to go. I need to go get a girlfriend. I need to get, go, you know, move in with a girl, do all these things. It's like, man, you got to think for yourself and figure out what you actually want. You can't be just living your life based on what other people are doing. Have you ever read Dataclism, the guy uh, who uh, started, he was the CTO at eHarmony? Sounds familiar. Sounds familiar. He wrote this book and basically, and it's, it's funny because Rollo Tomasi kind of parrots this stuff, which is women uh, are the most attractive. Again, this is not my opinion. This is what the <laughs> this is what the book says, is that women get the most right swipes around 23 to 25 and men get the most right swipes when they're 35, 38, and then going up from there. So yeah. a lot of times you'll have this situation where you have a man who's in his mid-20s and he's like about to get locked down with a girl who's in his mid-20s. And if he had waited until he was in his, his 30s, then he would have more options. Right? Have you yeah. seen that before? No, for for sure, of course. And and that's also the thing. Like when I was a guy in my early twenties trying to figure things out, I could get girls, but I was sort of broke, just trying yeah. to figure my life out. Right. And now that I'm in my thirties, and it's funny because a lot of guys in their early twenties think, oh, I need to find a wife now. I need to find a girl for now. It's, it's I'm running out of time. It's like, man, your thirties are your absolute prime. If yes. you're making money, you you have resources, you have you have game, you, you're you're able to communicate with women, then you're you're at your prime. You're at your top. You're at your top level. Right, most guys will never get there, but that's 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 the case. Your definition of game, what would that be? Because uh, every for everybody, it's a different thing, right? So, what 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 would you think that is? I would say it's like unstifled communication, being able to to communicate in an unstifled way with the women that you want, being able to lead things, be able to make connections, be able to get women attracted, and just kind of be able to create the types of interactions and connections you want. Yeah, it's all part of it. And then YouTube kind of changed things, right? Obviously, we saw. Uh, we had uh, Adam Lyons on here a couple weeks ago. He talked about the situation with RSD, the whole Julian Gate thing, which, and then at the same time, the Me Too movement was happening. And then there was questions about whether or not, and guys who weren't doing nothing wrong were getting their accounts taken down. Don't get me wrong, there were guys who were doing shit wrong, but there were guys who were doing nothing wrong. And then it became a, a point where every guy that I knew that was posting any kind of infield kind of stopped doing that because of uh, you know the consent culture. And then I see n now it's a lot of advice here, three trips. Here are three tips to doing X, Y, Z. You're doing it on reels. Have you had to make an adjustment because of that? Yeah, so we kind of realized a few years ago that guys were starting to get kicked off of YouTube for making approach videos. Mm -hmm. like, God, we don't want to risk this. This probably isn't even worth it to do have, anymore. Have you seen the signs in those malls where they are literally like arrest you for like going up approaching strangers? I haven't seen the signs. I'll show it to you. There's, there's a mall in Canada that has a sign up that literally calls out. And ma I'm, I'm, not, I'm not surprised it's happening yeah. in Canada. Yeah. It's probably like a Justin Trudeau thing. Yeah. You want to yeah. do, but, um, yeah, no. So we kind of transitioned from that to now with the Instagram reels, it, it allows us to do like short form, funny content and i'm mm. like all right instead of just going out and doing approaches i have women in my life anyway it's, it's easy to go get girls to be in these videos let's do some fun reenactments let's do some fun q and a's with girls right so like a little bit of stuff that you're doing with your stuff too and that allows guys to see you interacting with women see that okay this guy can actually flirt he mm. knows he knows a bit what he's doing at least and uh but it also shows a little bit of the girl's perspective and it just kind of gives a little bit of a different thing than you would just get from an approach video and it's also you know can be safe do you feel like the girl's perspective was something that was missing for, like, I felt like it was missing for something like 10 years where nobody really cared about the girl's perspective. And that's why a lot of the stuff wasn't working. Well, for, for a bit, I would say the girl's, the girl's perspective is important. A lot of times it's, you know, you have to challenge the girl's perspective yeah, a bit sure. too. A lot of times like what these, what, if you ask a girl what she wants, she's going to tell oh, you for something sure. completely I, yeah, different. I'm, I'm not, right? yeah, yeah, I agree with you on that. But, but it is interesting to kind of hear their take on it and well, then kind of challenge I, them a little when bit. I, when I'm talking about their perspective, one of the things I rarely, because I, I'm like you, I generally, when I ask women, why were you attracted to this guy? I get a lot, I get lines she tells me what she wants to think is true, but it's never, ever what's true. It's yeah. like, oh, you're dating the 6'5 male stripper because he's good with his family. <laughs> Got it. I understand now. Like, they never actually say the reason that they're dating the guy, right? Uh, but, but what I found, by the way, men have that problem too, that we, you know, uh, but the, the situation that I've seen is that generally what I like to ask is when there's a girl who's like my perfect archetype, I'm like, oh, how'd you meet your boyfriend? Oh, I met him this way. And it's almost always a girl introduced me or a friend of ours introduced me. And then the second thing I'm like, how long was it? Just, I'm asking for academic reasons. How long was it before the first time you met him and the first time you had sex? And then they go into it. I want to hear her 
her, uh, what's it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like her perspective, her yeah. perspective from that standpoint, like what actually the action she took when she was with this guy. But you're right. When she tries to describe it, it's like, yeah, but he was so nice. Like, dude, this guy treats you like shit. <laughs> yeah. He treats you like shit and you keep telling me how nice he is. And I'm like, you're so out of touch. Or the girl who just keeps asking me for advice and goes back to, I'm like, I, after a while, I'm like, hey, you're going to go back to the same dude. So it doesn't matter what I say. You know what I'm saying? So no, I do, I do kind of see both sides of that thing. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I definitely agree. Yeah. Um, so the, here's the thing. You had an interview with your dad, which I thought was like really freaking awesome. Your dad was like, oh, I've been trying to just trying to get locked down my son to do this interview forever. Right. And uh, he goes into some really interesting stuff. By the way, I've never said a cuss word in front of my parents in my entire life. And in fact, to this point, I, I, I always want to tell my mom, don't watch the show because she's I don't know if she'd ever heard <laughs> Keep me. It clean. He's never heard me cuss in front of her. Um, so you, your dad interviews you and you talk about going to University of Rhode Island. For, you're, you're from the Boston area? I'm from Rhode Island, actually. Okay. So I'm from Rhode Island, but I lived in Boston for a while, yeah. So why is that why you just chose University of Rhode Island? Was that where you always wanted to go? Was there anywhere else you wanted to go? Well, I was completely different when I was 15, okay. 16. I had no desires to travel the world, do any of the yeah. stuff that I've done. I had no idea that that was what's, what I was going to be doing. So I was like, oh, well, I'm good at accounting in high school. Let me just go to University of Rhode Island. They have a good accounting program there. Keep it simple. Keep it easy. Let's go do that. And then things kind of change after that. Have but. you seen, and it's to change the subject, have you seen like accountants on TikTok or like guys who do credit repair on TikTok and they have like these crazy fucking videos that are funny or that guy credit Steve Lau, have you seen him? I He's haven't got, seen Steve Lau, but I have seen a lot of these finance guys. I haven't yeah. seen too many accountants, but I can I can see a niche where they, they, they could do well on Dude, TikTok. Dude, Steve Lau, like he's like feeding credit cards to fucking porn stars on his IG while he has a blowtorch. <laughs> the shit is insanity. And it, like he's doing credit repair. And, like anything, I, I have friends of mine that are like, Michael, I can't do what you do because I'm an accountant. I'm like, yeah, you can. And then I show them these TikToks of guys that are like, <laughs> like driving Ferraris, giving accounting advice or something yeah. with girls in the back. It's just, it's really crazy. Well, it's funny how every video you're going to do is just going to do better with women in it, yes. right? Whether it's dating, accountant, whatever it's going to be. Like I always tell guys who are asking me about reels and stuff, like find a way to put women in your videos yes. and it's going to do way better. Isn't it interesting? I did feel though, like for a long time uh, with Red Pill and with the pickup community, uh, I would bring girls sometimes when m one of my friends would be speaking and the guys would just be quiet. As soon as I'd walk in the, the, I'd walk in the room and there, I'd have four girls with me. Everyone would go, oh, shh, be quiet. We can't talk about pickup stuff anymore. Shh. And I was like, why are, we, why are we quiet? What the fuck? Why can't we say this yeah. in front of women? There's nothing I'm saying that I, that I uh, even if they dis d disagree, I'm at least telling the truth, you know? No, exactly, exactly. It's like it doesn't have to be the secret society thing about what, what dating advice is and what pickup stuff is, right? I mean, I think the best thing for men is to not be creepy, and the best thing for women is for men to not be creepy. Yeah, yeah, and I think a lot of girls, it's, it's funny too, because like a lot of, I'm a single guy now, and yeah. a, lot, a lot of girls follow my Instagram stuff, and girls that I'm hanging out with and dating follow my Instagram stuff, and it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting for them to kind of see the perspective and me to just kind of be so open about it. It's kind of a new thing for me to kind of be in that. Isn't it weird, like the way IG story, like there was this thing where, a girl would text you and you'd get into a fight and then you'd go back and forth. And now like, you don't have to do that anymore. You just, she texts you, you don't like what she texts you. You leave her on scene and then you go in your IG story and you're in Ibiza. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like you're like, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, we were fighting. I'm on stage at this nightclub with all these other girls. And then you look and you can see she's watching your story. <laughs> yeah. Think about that. Think about how crazy that is. You can see, IG story is the, one of the most powerful things I've ever seen. You can see that she watched your story of you with some other girl and that she watched every consecutive story. And it's like, like the message gets across yeah. in like this weird passive aggressive social media <laughs> manner. She's over there like in her bedroom just fuming like I can't believe this <laughs> fucking guy. It's crazy. Bro, it is it is so great. It is so great, man. Uh, yeah, I tell people that all the time. Uh, a lot of times I'll have guy friends or I'll have clients and they'll build up their social media because that's one of the first things I tell them is like you have to You have to, to, you have yeah. to. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit because I'm, I'm interested uh, in, in your take on that. But they'll build up their social media, they'll start throwing some events and they're like, so Michael, who do I date? And I was like, who, who are the girls that watch every single one of your stories? I'll bet you if you ask one of them out, they'd probably say yes. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, it's like right there for you, you know? Yeah. That's why I think the IG story is just so powerful. Yeah, it's, all, it's a thing that can even allow you to keep in touch with girls for years. Mm -hmm. like I have girls from like six, seven years ago watching my story still, and I could hit them up and they'd be down to do whatever. So crazy. Right? It's, yep. it's nuts. It's a, it's a crazy form. Bro, why, you decided to move to Vietnam. What was that about? Yeah, man. So th this is right after college. I was uh, trying to figure out the whole online business thing. I actually got into copywriting, and I got a I got a job out there with a guy who was, you know, running a an American-based business in Vietnam. 
He's like, just come out here. I'll train you up. Let's go. And I had one buddy from Boston who's out there too, who's also a, a friend of mine from like the whole sort of like pickup scene. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just saw it as a huge opportunity to go out there, connect with tons of entrepreneurs. And there was a huge circle of entrepreneurs in Vietnam at the yeah. time. And it really just changed my life completely. Because number one, it, it culture shocked the hell out of me. I was in a place I'd never been to before. Asia is so different. Vietnam is yeah. so different. But then number two, there was tons of entrepreneurs. So I'd be, you know, out there at a cafe talking to a guy about his business, and then boom, I get like a, you know, a copywriting job with him, writing a bunch of emails for the next week, right? And it's oh, like I can keep sort of building my skill set and building my network out here, and it, it, yeah, which was it was a very like crazy opportunity, and it helped me build a lot. Uh, the copywriting is one of the things whenever I talk to younger people and like I want a job where I can travel. That's one of the first things I tell them. Can you describe what is copywriting? Uh, like what are the different type of things that you would end up writing? Yeah, so copywriting, what I was mainly doing at the time was email marketing. Okay. I was doing some sales letters. Um, but the main thing was was really email marketing. But really any sort of writing, like form of writing that sells is copywriting. Even if it's like an Amazon description, an Amazon book description, things like that. That's copywriting right there. You read copywriting every single day. Uh, and it's a great skill to have. Yeah. yeah. And how, how did how did you learn? You're just copying, like copy and pasting? Is there a, a, a syntax that you're learning? What is, what, what is the creative technique that caused you to become a good copywriter so i think there's probably some some better ways to learn it now maybe mm -hmm. some a little bit more efficient ways but the way i learned it was through handwriting sales letters and emails for like months and just reading a bunch of copywriting books mm. and i just started doing it i was sort of a, a proficient writer beforehand like i was good at i was always good at writing essays and things like that in school but i never really sort of honed the skill and once I really put my focus on that, it was game over. Because I was like, all right, I already kind of have some, some of the, the raw talent for this. Now I can just apply it. Let's and this go. you were making enough money to get by in Vietnam just from the copywriting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, you don't need much money to get by in Vietnam, at least in, back in 2014. If you were making two, three K a month, you were, you were very sufficient. So let's talk about it. You called it, was it travel arbitrage? Was that the, the name of it? Uh, income arbitrage. What is that? Was that was kind of your first experience with that? Yeah. Yeah. The income arbitrage, you know, being able to make an American income while you're over there in Vietnam, where if you can make 2K a month, you're living like a king. Like I, I was going out to restaurants every day. I had a, I had a relatively decent spot I was staying in and it was, it was all for far less than 2K a month. I don't know if you can still do that now in Vietnam, but there certainly are places you can do that. Uh, and there's other places around the world where it's even cheaper than that, even still right now. What uh, what are some of the other cities that you lived in like that? I, over the last eight years, man, I've been living all around the world. So you lived in Mexico City for a while. I lived in Mexico City yeah. for five years. That's a great spot, but it's get, kind of getting overwhelmed by the gringos right now. Yeah. Like 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 all the uh, all the American girls are going in there. You hear them with with the American lingo talking yeah. like like this, like that. Yeah. They got the Valiger yeah. accents. It's impossible to do anything over there without yeah. in like the main spots. So it's Mexico City is kind of getting washed out. But there's there's other spots in Colombia. There's places in. Uh, there's places in Brazil I'm trying to go to. Um, there's also like like oh, Bangkok's a great a great hub mm -hmm. as well. Uh, yeah, I would say I would even say like Europe. Like I'm I'm going to be going to Spain, but one of my favorite spots in Europe is is Berlin. That's even like a lot cheaper than the U.S. Still, places like Taiwan, kind of tough to go there right now. But it, the Taiwan ta Taiwan Taipei is a great city. Uh, so many great places around the world. This is a little off subject, but you, you're living in another city, but you're an American citizen, so you still do have to pay federal income taxes. How does that whole thing work? Well, there's a thing called the FEIE, yeah. which does allow you an exemption on like the first 100K of your taxes. So okay. it's not a huge thing, but it's, it's at least something that you get back. And there's other ways around not having to pay as much taxes if you become a resident in some different places. But are you, like so, so for instance, in Nevada, we don't have a state of income tax. In California, they do. Does your, do you still have a state of residence that counts against your uh, yeah, so income I'm still, taxes? Yeah, so I'm still Rhode Island. Okay. Yeah. Do they have in, uh, income tax there? They have income tax. They do. There, so yeah. do, time to get a place in Nevada. Yeah. No. Yeah. Exactly. Time to get a place I, in Nevada. I, I need what to switch it up. I need yeah. to switch it up. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, that's uh, that. I mean, there's a reason Bolzarian lives here is because yeah. you know that it makes sense. Part of the reason why, man. Uh, okay. So uh, the the other thing is you mentioned before, uh, getting outside the matrix, right? This is kind of. Um, the reason why the red pill is the red pill, why people call that whole thing the red pill is because they're taking it specifically from Morpheus and Neo from the movie The Matrix. The idea that I'm going to eat this blue pill and you are going to continue to watch Disney movies and believe a soulmate is coming for you and a 401k and you're going to work in a nine to five job and you're going to be happy. This is the matrix that you've been taught to believe. And then the red pill would be the idea of like, no, this isn't the world that you're actually living in. There's, these are ways that your money's being extracted either through inflation or the government or, or controls or whatever it is like that. And you can actually, if 
you want to choose to break free from this norm that everyone else is living in. You said break getting out of the matrix. Is that what you meant before? Is it financial matrix, a, a dating matrix, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, well, I think there is an aspect of sort of unplugging yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at like kind of what I've done and my, what my friends have done, we, we very meticulously sort of removed ourselves from, from like the normal American life where you work in the corporate job, you're kind of staying in one city, you, you can't, you don't have that much flexibility. We took ourselves out of that and strive to create a life where we could be anywhere at any time, have a global network, basically do whatever we wanted to do whenever we wanted to do it. And that's how, for example, I'm just like, all right, you know, this podcast in Vegas, let's let's come out here. Yeah. And, then, and then eight of my friends came, are coming over to join me. We're all staying here for a week. And then we're all traveling after that. We were in, you know, Columbia before this. And it's just, just, just be, being able to exist sort of outside the confines of what most people even consider as possible. Mm. For us, it's a lot of fun. A digital nomad, right? Yeah, be yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. Um, do, are you filming any content while you're here in Las Vegas? Yeah. No, I'm definitely planning to do some interviews with girls in the casinos, probably uh, maybe some reenactment stuff, like, like uh, some of the stuff I've been doing on my IG, yeah. some different scenarios. Yeah, it's too good of an opportunity. Yeah, but for sure. For sure. I, I, I've, I've been looking for like hot girls to do it on this trip, and I, we have we've been like walking around. We have not been able to find like yeah, good it's, it's gaggles of hot yeah, girls. Fremont free, free on a Tuesday, probably not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Omnia, where I was telling you to go last night, that would it would have been loud as shit, but it would have been just madness. The only thing I will tell you is like, don't be near the slot machines while you're doing the interviews. Just do it like on the regular carpet, because if you are, you have a phone out, they're gonna they're gonna say something. Oh, to you. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. the only thing. That, but other than that, that yeah, you, you that can pretty sense. much do whatever you want. Um, uh, what I was gonna say. So, and also, as long as it's a phone, you're good. If you're in a nightclub, you have like a DSLR. Yeah. They're not gonna. They're gonna kick you out. Uh, so the the uh, the other thing is, you wrote four books. Four books. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I've you know several experts say you know this is one of the ways to become a subject matter expert if you're a published author, right? On my my social media manager is like asking me to write a book. This is a. This seems like a really, really difficult thing to do, but it's something that you did. Were able to put something down on paper and and, and it made you a passive income from doing this. Yeah, no, and it's still making me a passive income from doing it, and it's actually pretty easy. Like mm -hmm. it's it's way easier than you think it is to write a book. Once you have a really good outline, you know what the subject matter is going to be. You outline it all the way through, and then you're basically just like filling in the blanks, right? And especially if you're writing a nonfiction book, it's like, all right, well, how am I going to break down how to have a conversation with a woman? All right, well, here are all the things you need to have in mind. Here are the mindsets. Here's the techniques. Here's here's everything you need to know. And then I just fill that in. And I already know it and you know can do some research along the way as well. But if you have that format, it's pretty simple to do. And the, the other big thing is you need to know people are actually going to want the book. Mm. You know, you, so you got to figure that out. Um, you can do you can run different ads to actually see if it's you know to prove the concept and things like that. What was the you said you learned a lesson from your first book to your second book to get the demand up before you sold your second yeah. book. What was the what were those lessons? So so my first book was called Vibe and uh, I thought okay, if I just write a book about I'm going to try to squeeze everything in here. I think it was the subtitle was Vibe like how to be an attractive man and like dominate your 20s and all these different things. And I was trying to do everything in one book and it was too much. Yeah. Versus okay, the next book I want to just write this book about conversation. People are always asking me, how do you talk to girls? How do you, how do you flirt? How do you do all this stuff? I'm just going to focus the entire book on that and create like a fun, catchy title and a fun, catchy cover. And that's what I did with Conversation Casanova. And then that book just completely blew up, you know, within, you know, right away, as soon as I did it. And it still sells really well today. Awesome, man. That's really cool. I know a lot of people would be into that idea. Again, the idea of living wherever you want to live, having a passive income that is going to be able to take care of your living expenses, right? Living in a place that's less expensive. That's all, that's all awesome stuff. That's a dream for so many people, even outside the dating community. That's a dream for a lot of people. Well, yes. And a lot, what a lot of guys don't realize is living outside of the U S your, you know, your, your sort of value in the dating marketplace also skyrockets, right? Whether you're, yeah. if you're hanging out in Latin America, you're hanging out in Asia, you, your, your dating value is significantly higher than it is when you're in the U S. So you have opportunities and options that would be a lot harder to attain if you were in the U.S. Can you talk about one of the things that when I had uh, Max on here, R.S.D. Max, he's on, I, I was telling him the things that I felt like pickup completely missed. And one of them was social media. I felt like they were way behind on that. There were a lot of, and I'm not, obviously I'm not talking about you specifically, but there were a lot of guys who I felt like, hey, my clients are creepy and I don't want them on Instagram. That's what it felt like to me, right? And I was like, no, man, you, everyone has to be on here because what happens is if this guy's got a 10% advantage over you, that 10% is now... 10% to the nth power because of the scalability of social media. The number one dating app in the world is Instagram. It's not Tinder, it's not Bumble, it's not Hinge, it's Instagram. So can you talk a little bit about that? What is the importance as far as social media? What do you tell your clients? 
Well, Instagram is basically your your dating resume. Yeah. Right. It's going to show off your lifestyle. It's going to show off what type of guy you are. If you're out here taking blurry cat selfies, then she's going to be like, "Who who is this guy? Like, what is going on here?" Yeah. Whereas if you actually know how to take a good photo, which most guys have completely no idea how to do, mm. and, and if you also kind of kind of just understand how to portray yourself the right way, good style, good posing, a girl's going to see your Instagram and say, "Okay, this guy is actually really cool." I do want to hang out with them. So if, even if you go out and talk to a girl on the street or in the club or something, and then you give her your Instagram, she's going to come back and follow you and be like, okay, this guy not only was cool in person, but he has a cool lifestyle. He seems cool here too. Seems like a quality person. Let's go. So one of the first things we work on with guys is number one, let's completely revamp the dating profile. Because let's be honest here, 99% of the pictures are going to be terrible. So we need to completely change mm. all of those, change the bio, the prompts. And then they can use those photos for Instagram, start building that out, and then continuously just have that be a skill that they use in terms of photo taking and posing. So that way, you know, once, twice a week, they just, they're adding new stuff to the profile, they're building it out. And then when they do go talk to girls, girls find it, you know, they find their, their profiles from online, all that, and it just dramatically helps them level up in their dating game. Do you teach anything about pre-selection? Yeah, I mean, yeah. A, a, a lot of the Instagram stuff too is about pre-selection, yes. right? Like, like posting good stories, you know, even like a fun story with with some girls, things like that. That that all plays into, it. and it's a lot, it's, a, it's a lot of what I do on my Instagram too. Like, like my Instagram is for my business, but I'm always in there with different girls. I have videos of different girls, and same with you. Yeah, uh, that's that's one of the funny things. So, a couple of things. Number thing, number one, pre-selection is a proven psychological effect. Uh, Dr. David Buss calls it the make copying strategy. It is not called pre-selection in psychology. There actually are other terms for it. But the idea of a male in any two gender species, most two gender species, almost all mammalian two gender species, having more access to more females makes even more females want more access to him. Because in most species, uh, not, not there's bonobos, there's some exceptions to this, but most of the time you're going to have like a few males populate the entire population. So if you have 100 men and 100 women, it's only 20 of the men that will populate with all 100 women. And this is like, a lot of people don't realize that the majority of men who've ever been born on this planet died a virgin. They don't realize that the, there's a stratification where, this is funny, and it, tell me if you've had the same experience when I talk to guys. It's about 20, 25% of guys who are like virgins late in life, like mid-20s all the way to 30s. And then we get into like up to the 60th percentile. I don't know if you know this, the average North American male has had seven sexual partners in his whole life, seven. And then, so now we're at the 60th percentile. And then once we get to the 80th percentile, the guy's been with 300 women. Once we get to the 90th percentile, he's been with like a thousand women. It, do, it doesn't look like a, a line. It looks like a hockey stick where there's this small group of men up at the top who are having unbelievable uh, access and every one of them is on social media or fantastically rich or has an Emmy. And then there's a bunch of guys at the bottom who are either cashiers at Walmart or you know work at a drive-thru and then, don't, and then take the weird fucking cat selfies like you were saying before. That, that's the thing, man. A lot of these sort of like average guys are getting lapped by, by the guys at the top yes. because the guys at the top have all this stuff built out they're already there. They're already making it happen. These guys, that, you know, these other guys sort of in, you know, that, that bottom 80%, they're just, oh, I'm trying to figure this out on my own. Well, you know, one day, like, I'll stumble across the girl who's going to be perfect for me. It's all going to work, work out. It's like, bro, it's not going to work out because guys, guys like us are going to take her. You know, like, we're going to meet her first. So you, ne you need to stop getting lapped. You need to find a mentor or at least, like, put the time in to get this handled because if you don't, it's not just going to work itself out. You're going to get left behind. There, there used to be a dating middle class, and there isn't anymore. There used, to be, there used to be the guy who lived in Des Moines who had a Mustang and a decent job, and he would date the girl who, the pretty girl at the Hooters. The problem is the pretty girl at Hooters is now at Bilzerian's house. You know what I'm saying? He's now at the Playboy Mansion. He's now at the Maxim Party. He's now at... at, at uh, she's, she has access to all these higher level guys because of social media. Correct. And she's going to take advantage of that. Yes. And if you're, you're just some nobody out here, like, you know, the Mustang in Des Moines, it's going to be a lot harder. It is. It, it, it's nearly impossible. Like, you've seen the, uh, the, the stats. Have you seen the Washington Post sur uh, survey? Or I believe, I can't remember which university posted it, but it was like 28% of men. This, it, there's, they show 2007. And it's about 12%. And then it spikes up to 28% after 2007. The number of men who had zero sexual partners since 2007, which was when we started putting social media on our iPhone. That was the same year that it started happening. And there's a correlation. There's a great book about this. It's called The Coddling of the American Mind, which talks about the incredible effects that it happened, that happened on dating and just um, human behavior once we started putting social media on our phones. Can you talk, have, is that something you've seen also? Like men not even be able to talk to women uh, and, and then also 
the, the, two things I found. Number one, social media causing men to not be able to look women in the eye and having normal conversations with women. And number two, men who have the advantage, the one who had the six pack abs, the Lamborghini and the mansion, now their advantage is a million times more than it was before. Yeah, well, Instagram definitely leads to guys pedestalizing really hot women. Yes. And and then like th there is there is almost none of that like average like girl next door type of thing anymore. Yeah. Right. Like because most Face of these out. girls out there, if they're hot, they know they're hot, and a lot of times they're going to be taking advantage of it. So you need to be on your game. You need to be on your shit if you're going to attract those types of women. And if you're not, then good luck. Yeah. Right. And then and then when it comes to the guys, you know, who already have the built-in advantages, now they're building it out even more because it's like everyone can see it right away. Way. he's you know the lamborghini isn't hidden away like the cool lifestyle isn't hidden away it's right there in your face women can see it and they're gonna want to be a part of it you know another crazy part of pre-selection is some of the the best good girls i've ever met got the master's degree perfectly beautiful former pageant model you know everything completely squared away when i meet their husbands or boyfriends these guys have like been with 500 women <laughs> have you noticed that also like it's because yeah. it, it, they're guys who legitimately think i'm going to be the good guy throughout my life and, and then I'm going to deserve this good girl. And whenever I meet these good girls, like totally squared away, the girl is like nothing. She's been with two dudes in her whole life, no tattoos, completely. And then you meet the guy she marries, and the guy's been with five, 600 women. I, I see this happen all the fucking time. Have you not, like, it, it's this misconception, because you talked about this in one of your videos where guys are like, oh, I just want to, I want to only talk to this perfect type of woman or set up my life for this perfect type of girl. And it's like, no, you need to have experience with with lots of different types of girls. Well, yeah, as a guy, you need to be going out there, you need to be dating different women, figuring out what you like and what you don't like, and and building that sort of abundance mindset, because if you're not, and you're like, oh, I just, there's this one girl that I want, and like it's only gonna be her. If you ever meet a girl like that, you're yeah. gonna be super needy, you're gonna ruin it, and, uh, and it, the, the likelihood that you're even gonna meet her in the first place is significantly lower. You need to be going out just dating a bunch of, a bunch of different women, you know, enjoying yourself, and then also learning the learning the lessons from those experiences, getting better all the time. Uh, the con the concept of a soulmate, I find it tends to be more women than men that believe in this. But have you had this issue before, where you meet these guys who think that they deserve, like somehow, this perfect partner is gonna f they, they deserve it because their parents told them that they deserve it, and they need to just wait, and it's gonna fall into their lap. Well, it's super funny to me, man, because like as a guy who goes out there does a lot of dating, like there might be one or two out of every 10 girls that I, that I go out with where I'm like, okay, I could actually see maybe some type of a future with this girl. Mm -hmm. And then th there, there's these guys out here who there's like, oh, this girl that I work with, she's my soulmate. Like, I, I want to try to make it work with her. It's got to be her. It's like, bro, like you, you don't even know what you want yet. You have, you have no idea kind of even what's going on here. Um, and, and yeah, it's like, like the concept of, of a soulmate, it, it really comes down to you going out, taking action, meeting a lot of different women, actually figuring out what you like and don't like because you're not just going to stumble into the perfect person. Even if you do, you're not going to know how to run that relationship if you know, you're just well, waiting for you're, it to come You're not, not going to get that person because you deserve them. You're going to get yeah. that person because you earned them. You're going to get that, like, again, they're not going to be with you because you show your intent. They're going to be with you because you have some level of status or competency or something going for you. Otherwise, it's not, it's not really going to work out. One of the, I had, a, I had a, client, a guy write me one time, and he was like, Michael, I love your program, but the girls that you have on your program, they're just too fake, and like they're not good girls, and so this would never work, and you should have more good girls. And so he, he sends me profiles of these three girls that were good girls, and they were like very, very model-looking, skinny, whatever, and then he goes, these girls aren't like the other girls you showed, and it took me five seconds to find their fucking OnlyFans account. <laughs> and the, guy, the girls are getting railed by like three guys at the same time, and I send it back to the guy, and I'm like, like uh, owned, like sorry, bro. Like no, you're wrong. It, it's so funny when I see this. Like there's these men that have this idealized view of what the world is going to be like, and it's just not that way. So while we're while she's learning and I'm learning, let's get these reference experiences together as many as we can, so that we know what we want later on. Super, super key. Yeah. Um, so now your partner, how to beast? How did you meet him? Uh, what's the story uh, going going on with him? What do you think the key for his success has been? I mean, we used to run out and, uh, and talk to girls together back in the early days in, in Boston. This is back in like 2011, 2012. And uh, initially we had a mutual friend who connected us, you know, a mutual friend we had both been going out with. He connected us. Oh, you guys both have similar blogs. You guys should link up. We, we, we met up, we, you know, we vibe really well. He helped me write, you know, some of my books. And uh, we ended up moving in together to this tiny little one bedroom apartment in Boston back in 2015. Uh, when we were both kind of on the come up. And uh, 
yeah, from there, we've always kind of helped each other out, motivated each other. It's been fun. And I, I got more and more into the dating coaching stuff. And then uh, he saw me doing that and he blew up on YouTube. So yeah. he, he, he basically just had, you know, an unlimited size audience of guys who were looking up to him, following his, his success. And uh, it just seemed to make the most sense for us to combine our skill sets Combine, you know, we complement each other in a lot of ways. Like I'm, I'm a bit more extroverted. He's a bit more introverted. He's he's really good at the daytime stuff. I'm really good at the nighttime stuff. And it, and it just it made sense to to combine our skill sets. Oh, and interesting. Okay, I didn't program. realize that. Yeah. I thought he was a fitness coach the first time I saw. I didn't know that he was doing. Uh, the dating stuff. I had not seen that before. Yeah, I knew well, you he, were doing the dating he stuff. Did, he would like sprinkle it in a bit, okay. like dating and confidence stuff. And like he did a lot of approach videos and things like that too. Uh, but then, yeah, like once we started doing this, he did a little bit more of that. But, but it really kind of is like us and, you know, us and then also his fiance, Julia, kind of combined to kind of build mm. out this program. Yeah. Yeah. That's another thing, man. Whoever I'm dating, I tell them everything about my program. I bring yeah. them on my calls. I introduce <laughs> them to my clients. That's there are hilarious. no fucking secrets. There's no fucking, I've yeah. been open on the show, I've talked. I date women who date women. I am not going to lie about this. I'm never going to promise a woman monogamy when I'm not going to get. Uh, so, so, so I'm curious. Like, do you have different ways that you screen out girls for that, and also different environments where you you found that is is best for meeting those types of girls? Yeah, the best environment for meeting those type of girls is called Clark County, Nevada. But that's <laughs> the, that's it because there's so many beautiful women here. Women who are like women move here or they okay. come visit here. Like that. That to me. It's been like this a little bit in Los Angeles, but definitely no place I've ever been. Like literally, I will go out with 10, 11 girls and every one of them is bisexual. It, it's, it's, okay. it's, di it's different here than any other place I've ever been. That's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, as far as, it's not really screening them out. Um, my whole philosophy is a little different because I was exposed to, to that kind of stuff, the cold approach stuff for a long time, right? I mean, I was friends with Mystery and, uh, and Owen and Neil Strauss, right? They're, these guys are all in my phone. Uh, but the thing is for me, I was more of the dude is like, I want 100 female friends and I might be dating eight of them and the other 100, they walk into a party with me or I introduce them to, um, really awesome. One of my female friends years ago, I used, I don't talk to her as much anymore, but it's Crystal Hefner, Hugh Hefner's wife, her and I hosted a bikini competition together. And then she would invite me to the Playboy mansion. And I just remember listening to guys being like, you can't be friends with girls. I'm like, yeah, the fuck you can. You better fucking, believe. you think I'm going to try to steal Crystal Hefner? <laughs> the fuck is wrong with you? No, she got me into the Playboy mansion. Me and a plus one. Yes, Crystal, anything you want. Can I get yeah. you a drink? What can I do for you, ma'am? Like, are you kidding me? I, I just thought that, that part seemed like really short-sighted to me. But, um, but like it was, it was a situation where, to me, I like going out with 20 or 30 girls at once. And then there is no game when you're with 20 or 30 girls. It's a function of competition. And that lifestyle is very easy for people to do with no money. That's the part that's so mind-blowing to people, especially when you live in Las Vegas. If I have 20 girls with me, I don't need money because no one's going to charge me for shit. I'm going to go to SDK and they're going to comp my dinner. Or I'm going to go to Beauty and Essex or I'm going to go to uh, Fuhu or wherever. They're not going to make me pay for shit. And then I'm going to get a table and they're going to give me unlimited bottles all night. What do I need money for? Like, I just, the part is just so mind-blowing to me. It's like, And then when I tell guys, it's like, no, none of that's real, Michael. Sorry, you're rich and you pay these girls and I don't know, they're all hookers. And I'm like, man, it's like, it's so, it, so it, it's a different philosophy. And then also in my philosophy, because I have so many female friends, one of the things that happens is I'm very open. And I'm like, hey, have you ever dated women? And the ones who are, have dated women, I tell them straight up, it's like, I never want, because there are monogamous women, I'm sorry, monogamous, heterosexual women that I'm dating. And I tell them straight up, I'm like, this is what I'm usually into. And they're like, wow, that's kind of disappointing. But they, they'll still date me. They don't stop dating me because of that. Because I'm the first man that they've ever met who is that fucking honest about it. They've never been with somebody who is just unapologetically honest. And I think for me, it happened... I remember it was 2005. I was in a, uh, I was, we were about to land an aircraft at fucking Robbins Air Force Base and uh, Warner Robbins, Georgia. And I thought we were going to die. We had broken the fucking vertical stabilizer or a horizontal stabilizer. It wasn't functioning. We were going to nose into the fucking runway. I thought we were going to die. I'm texting the girls like, hey, listen, uh, it was nice knowing you. Like, I remember saying this shit like, I'm going to die here. After the fifth time I was in, a, no, fifth time, I was in a three, legit three burning airplanes while I was in one, first time I was over Iraq in, in 06. And after that, it was like, hey, I'm, I might die. So I'm never going to bullshit with you from the gate. This is what I want in this relationship. If you don't want this, let's move on. And the crazy, I had Justin Waller on here from uh, Hustle University. And I was like, the crazy thing that happens is when you tell them exactly how this is going to be and you wait for them to walk out that door, they don't walk out because you are the first man they have dealt with in decades that absolutely is never going to lie to them. 
You understand? And so I tell them, hey, you want to know why I, I like women who like women? It's not because I need to have threesomes every night. Those are great, but that's not why. The reason why is because I never, when you ask me, do I think that girl's hot? I can tell you, yes, she's hot. And you're not going to get jealous. That's, and it's so fucking liberating to be able to do that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Definitely, man. No, and, and it sounds like you have this whole city on lock, which is awesome. You know, there's something to be said for having a home base yeah. and just you know, building it out in the, yeah. the exact way that you want to build it yeah. out. I haven't had a chance to do that because I've been bouncing around so frequently, but that's kind of my next goal is like find, picking a city and just building it as a home base, you know, bringing a crew there yeah. and just having a great time and, and just doing all these types of things as well. Everyone will visit you at least twice a year if you live here. Yeah. If you, li <laughs> if you, live, in, if you live in Phuket, they're not going to visit you <laughs> yeah. twice a year. Okay, if you live in Wichita, let me tell you firsthand, they're not going to visit you twice a year. Everyone visits me twice a year here, which is incredible, right? Yeah. Every, and here's the other thing. Everyone that you've ever wanted to network with from a financial standpoint, Elon Musk is here at least twice a year, right? Like Jeff Bezos is here twice a year. You know, everyone comes here for a convention at least once. Every millionaire, every real estate agent, every, um, you know, uh, mortgage broker, uh, real estate developer, uh, you know, whoever, attorney, they're going to come here once or twice a year. So the networking here is, it's, it's the, the in real life network. I think this is the best city in the world to host a podcast because so many guests come through here. More, Los Angeles is terrible because a lot of us like, well, no, LA's got more celebrities. The problem is there's nowhere to park. The problem is the traffic. Here, there's, you saw, there's no it's traffic open. here. It's, it's open. open. It's easy, yeah. This is the easiest place to host a podcast, I swear, in the whole world. Uh, because everyone comes and visits me at least twice a year. Yeah. You understand? So that, that's what makes it so great. That's why I love this city so much. The other thing is like, I, because I was in the military for so long and I'm, I'm flying around the world all the time. When I moved here, I'm like, nah, I'm good. I don't really need to go anywhere. Everyone's going to come visit me. I want to go to Brazil. There's a club, there's a hotel over here called the Rio. I'm just going to hang out at Rio. It's like, I'm, I'm going to have to check that place out. <laughs> I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to Italy. I'm going to go over here to the Bellagio. Let's say we're in Italy right now. Right. want to go to Asia. Let's go to, let's go to the wind, you know, <laughs> let's do, do whatever. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's. I wanted to travel less and less the more I fell in love with the city, right? And I'm 45 too, so like that's part of it uh, also. But yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's just, a, it, I prefer this lifestyle just because I like being in places with 40, 50, 60 girls that I'm friends with and then just like not, the, every girl I date is introduced to me by a girl who's like a playmate or a Maxim model, every one of them. And I, I just, I love that lifestyle. Does that make sense? It's awesome, bro. Yeah. It's awesome, yeah. Yeah. Um, so here's the other thing. So how to be, you, you, let's keep going with that. So you, he, he blows up on YouTube. What do you, what do you see while that's happening? Like there's a moment where you're like, God damn, this is like really blowing up for you. What is he doing? That's causing that to happen. And you, you also have some videos with millions of views. Like what's going on there? Is it a different, are you hitting the algorithm at the right time? Is this a growth time in YouTube? Like what's going on there? Yeah. Well, in terms of YouTube, I think beast came up in like 20, I think he started making videos in 2016, mm -hmm. either 2016 or early. Actually it might've been early 2017. And, and he really put a focus on sort of the daily vlog content with advice and no nobody was really doing that at the time yeah. and, and like that format with some really cool edits really caused things to just completely blow up for him i think mm. like within within a year he had, he must have had a few hundred thousand subscribers and it just kind of kept blowing up from there and he he was always telling me bro you gotta get into youtube you can make that happen and i eventually started my channel as well uh and he just kept along i don't think he's ever missed a video in like since, since 2017, he's done two, two videos every single week. Uh, so it's been great to see. He's just dedicated, committed, and uh, yeah, he's a great guy to work with, a great guy to be partnered up with on, on like this type of a business. His so, editing team, how does that work? Does he he edits team? all the videos himself. Get yeah, out of he's, here. He used to have an in-house editor that we had at our office, and then we went back to being remote, but uh, yeah, he, he does all the edits himself. He's very meticulous, so, so it's hard for him. So to, uh, I still timestamp my videos. I, do, I make it, it takes me about two hours every week to timestamp my videos so that I can send the timestamps to editors, and I put asterisks next to the time. If you guys are watching this video right now, go in the comment section, you're going to see a, a comment that I put in there. The, the ones with the three asterisks next to it, those are the ones that are going to become TikTok videos. That's what I do. I send that to my editor, then my editor cranks out like 10, well, 10, like 10 clips from this interview. Yeah. And that's what's worked for me, is that because we'll do two hours, and there's a bunch of clips in there. Uh, that's what I found to do. But my, my team is like, dude, stop fucking doing this you're wasting we need you to do other shit yeah then then sit there and edit i had no idea how to beast edits his own videos that's crazy man yeah he's just too meticulous he like he it's, it's hard for him to trust other people editing his stuff so. so he when he travels he's just got a, a macbook and he's just grinding these things yeah. out bro yep. that is <laughs> rendering like rendering is a bitch man it just takes forever you know what i'm saying no, that's it, crazy. It, it is that that's why i switched more to instagram because it, those those videos are easier to make yeah. they're more fun to, to add girls into them 
time and very easy to edit too. I don't do the edits anymore, but very, very easy to, to put everything together. To, uh, together. That's nuts, man. Um, wingman with your father. Talk about this. You said one night you went out and you were winging with your father. <laughs> Yeah, so my, my dad's a comedian. He's yes. a funny guy. And uh, one of my first nights after college, it was actually the night after I, I graduated, we went out in Boston. He had a comedy show at Nick's Comedy Stop, which is a big, like, legendary comedy comedy uh, venue out there. And there was this club there right afterwards. I was like, oh, let's, let's hit the club and celebrate a little bit. So me and my dad roll out. I think I'm 21 at the time. And uh, just hit it up hard. Like, I was out there. I was making out with girls, dancing with them. And he was just hanging out, talking talking to some of their friends. Like, it was it was a hilarious time. And because uh, he's, you know, I, I get the wolf in me from him, you know. Okay. Like, from, from when he was younger, he was in the Navy, traveling the world and everything. And, and a lot of his sense of humor when he's messing with the crowd on stage is a lot of, like, what I do as well. So, yeah, it's, it's always fun to, uh, that, that was one of the only times that we've done it. But it, it was a lot of fun. What a, I mean, for a lot of people, that's probably a cool yeah, cool. I, I never got to do anything like that with my dad, dude. Yeah. You got a wing with my dad. That's that's pretty crazy. Um, simple pickup. What was that? What was that whole? I'd heard about this before. I had a couple of friends that were involved in it. What was that whole company like? Yeah. So they, they had like this competition back in the day. If, if you sent them, they were looking for a guy to, to go like do, do a bunch of videos for their thing called Project could you, Go. Could you imagine if they tried to do this again right now? <laughs> yeah. I don't think it would work too yeah. well. But uh, I was like, all right, this, this sounds like a good opportunity. I'm going to go out and film some approach videos. I was nobody at the time. I'd never done anything like this before. I might have had a few posts up on my blog, just made a few approach videos talking to girls. And then a few more went viral, sent them over to Simple Pickup. They loved it. They interviewed me a little bit. And then they, they flew me out to, uh, to L.A. to film a bunch for, for their, their program, Project Go. Mm. And that was just basically me and a bunch of, you know, infield videos with them. And that was fun, you know, singing out with Kong, uh, Jason and Jesse, they were all really, really cool guys. I know they're all successful in different ways now. You know, they, they've since split apart. I think like, I think they split apart shortly, like a few years after I was hanging out with them. But uh, yeah, no, it was a very fun experience to be able to go out there and do that. They had a great business. Like they, they were sort of the sort of the titans or like the pioneers of the approach video. Interesting. Uh, and they, they were doing it in a different kind of way. Mm. You know, they kind of started the whole prank thing too which was interesting to kind of see develop when they were just going out using, doing cheesy pickup lines, that type of thing. How about this whole weird um, cycle where the squeeze page, the original squeeze page was invented by Evan Pagan. You can look this up if you guys don't believe me. Evan Pagan went by the name of David D'Angelo. David D'Angelo kind of like, he wasn't like a great pickup artist, but he coagulated this entire industry where he was started throwing, the, he started filming large groups of dating coaches on stage together. And uh, uh, what was the what was that one called? Double your dating was that the name of the? Yeah, it was a video. I, I used to listen a, to that back DVD, in high school. DVD set <laughs> that you could get, and like again, the toxicity that came later in pickup did not exist at this point. There were just a bunch of dudes who legitimately like were just trying to help each other. Yeah, uh, and and when you go back and watch that stuff, it's crazy because. He invents the squeeze page. Then he comes up with a second product. Do you remember Get Altitude? Did you ever see that one? I didn't see that one, no. Highly recommend it if you get a chance to go back in it. He goes back and he basically pulls the curtain back. He's like, this is what I did to turn to make $100 million selling these, these courses. That's what I did. And then he goes into it. He talks about the squeeze page. He talks about all these books to read. He has all these experts. And he's Eben Pagan on stage. He's not David D'Angelo anymore, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's funny because then what happens is you have a bunch of dating coaches who go in this area. And then... From the dating coaches, the self-help guys, the Grant Cardones and, the, and all those guys, they are Tony Robbins, they start using the squeeze page technology that came from the dating coaches, right? And then it comes, it comes full circle again, where now we're sitting here using, we have, we have uh, sales funnels, right? Everyone's got sales funnels, we hire sales teams, and we're just like, half of us are teaching dating and half of us are teaching self-improvement. And it's just, it's really funny how this whole industry changed. And you can put Ty Lopez in there, right? Ty Lopez, like, here, come look at my Lamborghini and buy this product. And he's, he's sort of teaching dating and he's touching, telling you how to make a million dollars while he's got like seven 20 year olds sitting behind him. And he's asking like this whole fucking thing. It's just funny to watch it. I'm 45. I watched this whole like uh, transformation happened with all these guys blowing up on social media, either being fitness guys, either being relationship guys, or even being money guys, or being like mindset guys. It really is funny. So from your standpoint, you've seen that before. I'm sure you've seen this before. Were there was there anybody who motivated you? Was besides How to Beast? Was there some people that you watched? Was it a Casey Neistat? Was there a, was there anything? Did you build your business based on watching anybody else? 
I wouldn't say I, I built my business like really meticulously watching somebody else, yeah. but I've always I've always looked to hire mentors. So okay. I've always looked to hire like mentors, consultants with a, a specific type of business that I wanted to build. Okay, how do I actually do this? How do I grow this thing out? Because I'm a dating coach, I'm not a business guy. How do I become more of a business guy? Yeah. And that's the the side benefit of all these things that you're talking about is it's made mentorship super easy now. You know, you yeah. have the Men of Action program. I have my dating coaching program. And it's like before maybe getting online mentorship was just kind of this weird thing. But now it's very mainstream. And that allows any average guy to come in, get mentored on anything that he wants, whether it's business, dating, finance, whatever it may be, and level up his life significantly if he's willing to invest in himself. Mm. It's a unique time. Um, who are some of your mentors? So my, event, my, so my mentor is uh, one of them, Valentino, Valentino St. Louis. Yeah, I, met, I yeah. met him at a, 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 we were on stage at a nightclub one night. Yeah, one no, night, he's yeah. actually over here in Vegas. We, we've been hanging out. He, cool. he's, he's a really, he's probably, he's probably one of the smartest guys. I've, what I've is, ever what does he specialize in? He specializes in business consulting, okay. just kind of helping, helping guys, you know, build businesses like, like these. Um, he dabbles in some other things as well, but he's a really, really smart guy. He's with you yeah. and How to Beast, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And, and he's, he's, he's the main guy I work with right now. I've worked with some different guys in the past, but, uh. Yeah, it's been fun working with him, just always getting blind spots pointed out, whether it's business, whether it's life, habits, all those types of things, making sure things are on point. Uh, another guy, like I have mindset coaching too, this guy Lance the Mentalist. Okay. He's awesome. He's on Instagram. Uh, he, does, he does like hypnosis, mm. which I found super, super helpful to really just, you know, you talk things out in a very therapeutic way, and then you do the hypnosis to let it sink into your subconscious mind. Got it. So whether you're trying to get over a breakup, you're trying to get past a business hurdle, there's a lot of things, there's all this BS like floating around your head. And, you know, talking to a guy like Lance, he's able to kind of decipher, all right, what's going on? How do you get past this? All right, now let's do the hypnosis to make sure that it actually stays and, you know, creates a transformation. Yeah. That's, those, those are some of your mentors. Yeah, uh, yeah. Do your sales team, does Valentino handle that also? So he, he helps us with that. Okay. But, but I, I kind of I manage everything in that realm as well. Your funnel. Does you have someone who built a funnel for you? Yeah, so so me and Beast kind of work together, kind of building that out, okay. hiring developers and things like that as well. Very so it's cool. like a, we have a lot, a big team as well, like a lot, a lot of different processes that we follow. Nice, awesome, man. Yeah, that's that's one thing. I found a couple of people mainly around uh, Dan Fleischman and Brad Lee, and kind of like who they trust. I, I like Brad Lee a lot. I've, yeah. seen, I've seen his clips. I, I, you guys watch my reels; they're copies of Brad Lee. I'm very <laughs> open about it. Like I follow what Brad Lee does because I watched Wes Watson was talking to me about how much he loved what Brad Lee was, so I've paid more attention to it. And then I started copying what he did uh, as far as that's concerned. And then Cole Gordon does my sales guy. My, uh, the, my offer is from Nick Cosman, the, uh, uh, the copywriter. Uh, and then I have different people. Char Modell does my social media. And I just got involved with Unruly, uh, the modeling agency. They're actually they, they're going to do promotions for my social media. So, yeah, I, because I trust these people. I've seen them with my own eyes blow other people up. That's why I chose them. That's the thing that makes it kind of difficult because every five minutes someone's hitting you up about gaining 250,000 followers on Instagram. You know, uh, I'm going to hire your sales team. You're not going to have to pay me anything. And I'm like, I don't know who to trust. Yeah, I, I get 50 emails from different copywriters every day at this point. Yeah. Which, which, is, kind of, which is kind of funny. Yeah, yeah. But uh, no, it's awesome that you've delegated all of that. Like, yeah. I need to delegate more of my stuff as well. Uh, no, but it's, it's been awesome to see your stuff grow too. Yeah. I mean, I can't believe uh, I'm just so lucky to have uh, you know, Grant Miguel. Uh, Grant and Miguel handled the paid side of my of, of the marketing and me and Char handled the organic side yeah and it's almost like a little competition you know what i'm saying yeah. we're, we're winning and then they they raise the ad spend and then they're winning well it's that kind of that kind of thing so yeah. I, I i love having this team man it really is great and the other thing with my team is i do tell them you guys can outvote me i'm very open i'm like i need i need you to tell me when i'm if you think i'm fucking up you can cuss at me and i want you to know that even though i'm ceo if you guys outvote me we'll do whatever you guys say and that's that's also been pretty helpful too. We get a lot better communication that Good. way yep um let's talk about this um you don't like having a boss. You said before you've cussed out previous bosses you've had. Yeah, uh, I specifically remember one time I was working at Cracker Barrel as a as a dishwasher back in uh, back in like twenty two thousand and maybe nine, mm -hmm. and uh, they they wouldn't give me the day off that I wanted to take off. I wanted to go hang out with some girl, and because they didn't give it they didn't give it to me off, I was like, screw this, I'm out. Like I ripped my shirt off, and I just stormed out. Told the boss like. You know, like I'm out, like I'm done, and and that was it. Then I had to, you know, meander my way back into the uh, into the office the next week to collect my paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> I still had to do back then. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's never worked out for me having real jobs, you know, for too long. I think the longest I've had is is maybe ten months, and then I pretty much had to get out of there. So 
it's it's hard for me to to, to follow orders. Yeah, it's an entrepreneurial lifestyle. And then the other thing I liked, you talked about this uh, briefly, was dating bleeds into other parts of your life. So as you improve in this part of your life, it can help you with business and other aspects. Can you go into that? Well, if you look at why a lot of guys aren't successful, what is the reason? Like they lack consistency, they, they lack intention, they lack just sort of the ability to stick to something and actually just you know, get it done. They lack the ability to make decisions and be decisive. They lack, they lack the ability to, to do things that they're afraid of. And all of those things stop them from being financially successful. It stops them from building the social circles they want, the lives they want. And all of those things have to be solved if you're going to create the dating life that you want. Hmm. So early on in the phase of improving dating, you have to be more decisive to approach a girl that you want to talk to. You have to, you know, have some intention behind the type of girls that you want to meet. You have to step in and do things that you're afraid of. And if you're not doing those things, you're not going to improve. Mm. So as you do that, everything else starts to improve because you, you become dramatically more confident in yourself. And then uh, an abundance mentality. This is a kind of a key thing, I think, for all different parts. You, you talked about before about, um, let's, let's, actually, let's get into this first when we go into abundance. Cheating, right? So people getting cheated on. I'm sure you get this question. I get this question all the time. How do I get her back? Right. What do I do to get her back? How do I get over this whole cheating situation? And I remember one of your videos, your response was abundance. Right. Can you go into that? Well, in terms of cheating, if it's the if the guy cheated on the girl, a lot of times there's there's some sort of hidden thing of like, you know, does he really want to be with her? Um, or it, like, is there something kind of gone, you know, going astray, astray in the relationship? So that that's one thing to keep in mind. You might not actually want to be with this girl in the first place. Mm. You might be sticking with her because you want the safety, you want the comfort, but maybe there's something inside you that wants to be with somebody else mm. too, right? So maybe you shouldn't be with this girl in the first place. Uh, but yeah, having abundance is is going to allow you to, okay, if it's not going to work out with this one girl, maybe you cheated on her, maybe she cheated on you, it's just things aren't working out, then you know that you can go get a girl just as high a quality as her or even higher because mm. you know that you're continuing to level up. But most guys, they, they maybe they luck into the girl that they want, and, uh, and then if they lose her, they can't do anything else. They have no idea how to get another girl like her because they've never built the skill set. So by building the dating skill set, creating abundance in your life, it's a lot easier to walk away from situations and girls where maybe you shouldn't be in in the first place. So, Doctor uh, Andrew Tate had the, some of these. Doctor uh, Tate, Doctor Tate, right? Andrew <laughs> Tate. I was talking about Doctor Bus and Andrew Tate. Uh, Andrew Tate had some opinions about this, where it's way more deleterious if a woman cheats than if a man does, and that was really controversial. And then you would go look at the uh, When Men Behave Badly, the book by Doctor Bus, and it kind of shows that is the case. When men cheat, they're not trying to end the relationship. Like you said before, a man might cheat just because he was looking for sex outside the relationship. And when a woman cheats, it is generally this is the end, man. Yeah. You are about eighty percent of the time you are near near its disaster. So women cheating and men cheating is there a double standard? There is because it is. I personally think. It is much more of a red flag if a woman's cheating than if a man is. It's definitely different. It's, it's definitely actually, different. Well, let, me, let me restate that. I don't personally believe that. The science indicates that. Go ahead. Yeah. No, it, it's definitely different. I, I think if a guy cheats, um, you know, he might just have a little bit too much wolf in him, right? And, uh, <laughs> and, and it's hard. Shout out to the wolves. Yeah, he can't, he can't quite let that part of himself go. Uh, and then if a woman cheats, yeah, she's, she's not going to cheat on a guy that, you know, that she loves, that, that she wants to keep things going with because there's too much on the line for her. Uh, you, there were a bunch of Instagram reels that you made and they had these quick tips and I loved it. It was 90 seconds. You gave these quick tips. So some of them were like, hold your glance, be the one who leads, having fun questions, uh, an abundance mentality, talking slower, man, what a fucking great one that was talking. slower. can you talk about some of the, was it, were these questions that you got or was this like a technique where it's like, Hey, here's three things that can do that. I saw trip Kramer. This is all trip Kramer does. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh, is, is, is this a technique you learned? Is this, has this been very effective for you as far as getting clients? Is this the kind of, so like the quick tip, yeah, the quick, quick tip videos? Yeah. Well, I think for Instagram reels, they work really, really well because you're basically just trying to give them, give people one good piece of content, one good thing that they can take away and actually take some action on. And a lot of people aren't actually going to take action on it, but, uh, but you're, you're giving them something and they want just enough for them to keep wanting more. Right. So here's like one quick tip about, you know, here's maybe a line that a girl could say to you and here's what you can say back. Here's like a shit test that you can pass. Yeah, even little things like that uh, just makes people want to keep coming back. I want to see the next video. This is it starts becoming addicting. And I think that's it. When I started doing those types of videos, my Instagram blew up from like 10K followers to 100K really, really quick. Isn't it crazy? Yeah. It, but isn't it crazy how some of those reels will go viral weeks after you post them? Yeah. Like out of nowhere. Again, I've had several go 700,000, 2 million. Yeah. And like the week I posted them, it was 10K. Yeah. It happens on TikTok all the time too, yeah. where like, you know, video will die out a little bit and then, you know, 
Yeah, this happened to me yesterday. That video all of a sudden got like 200,000 extra views out of nowhere. No. Like a day. Yeah. It's like an investment. Reels are like an investment. So let's go actually go back to this. This is a conundrum I've had to deal with. I was teaching my clients how to build this incredible grid. So shout out to Corey Chaloff because he was teaching this also. Uh, how to build this incredible grid of photos where it shows you having like this wonderlust lifestyle. You're getting out of the BMW i8. You're standing at the uh, the Valley of Fire in you know it, here in Nevada, or you're at um you know you're you're in front of the the uh, the whatever, or the Eiffel Tower, or you're in some cool crazy place. You know you're on a jet ski, you're on a yacht, whatever. And we would create this grid where you know the Burj Khalifa is behind you and you're swimming, whatever. And it showed access to scarce resources. It showed that you could travel. It made, it was almost creating this thing where like the girl wants to come with you. And it was very effective. And then reels come out and they just shit on these photos. You know what I'm saying? And like me, I'm posting three a day, three reels a day. Those photos of me at those parties with all those girls, they're 100 photos down now. <laughs> You understand what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. And we're at, and, I, and I argue with uh, Shar sometimes, like, hey man, can we just take the reels off my grid so I can just actually show people that sure. I, you know, have a cool life? No, we're just gonna put. It looks like I've just been hosting a podcast for 25 years, right? <laughs> That's what it looks like on my. So have you had this issue too? Because like those lifestyle photos that you probably posted before, it's nothing but reels on your page now. Well, one thing you can do is you can, and I'm working on this now, is is going out there getting a bunch of great photos that like you're talking about, yeah. and then pinning them to the top. Yeah. So I can pin three. Yeah. If I could pin like six, maybe it'd be okay. That and would I, be a little bit more. Ideal. And I and I switch them. I have to switch the ones I pin. But every couple of days, I have to scroll way the fuck down to the bottom, find those photos, and then pin them up to the top. Yeah. But the other thing you can do too is just like make reels of you with the girls, right? yeah. which I know you've been doing as yeah. well, which kind of adds to the pre-selection and, and adds to the to the overall personal brand yeah. too. Yeah, by the, way, by the way, it's not a flex. I don't think it's a flex for you either. It's literally like, hey, everyone else here is a fucking scam artist. Here yeah. I am standing next to a girl who is not creeped out by me. Do you see this? Yeah. This is not what you're used to. Yeah, like if you ask yourself, okay, what does a successful dating coach look like? Is it a guy who's just alone in all of his videos in his in his apartment or something? Yeah. Or is it a guy who's constantly with women, you know, like you surrounded by women, you know, at the beach parties with me, you know, all over the world, just bouncing around, you know, filming with girls? That's to me, that's what a successful dating coach looks like. And that's what I want to convey to, to my audience is like, all right, okay, this guy is around women all the time. He understands how to interact with them. He's not just in his apartment just talking bullshit. Uh, I love this one. Uh, one of my favorite ones was, how, did, uh, how do I date a coworker? Do you remember this one? <laughs> yeah. What, what was that one? Yeah. So, so guys are always asking, okay, how do I date a girl from the office, a coworker? And generally, it's just not going to be a good idea. No, the way yeah. you cut it was perfect. He's like, how do I, how do I date a coworker? Step one, don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> step, step, step one, don't. Like, there's no reason to, to put your whole career in jeopardy for one girl. And if you're even thinking about doing that, it means you don't, you don't have that abundance we were talking about where you, you, don't, you can't go talk to a girl on the street. You can't go talk to a girl in the gym. You just don't know how to do it. You should learn that first. Get t get ten of you know ten beautiful girls in your life, and then see if you still want to go talk to Susie from HR. Probably not. Yeah, isn't it funny how that works? Like, yeah, uh, guys will ask, "How do I get over my ex?" I'm like, "Well, you need to date other women." Actually, go to the gym. I tell my guy friends um, or my, some of my clients, I'm like, "Well, um, I want to talk to my ex." I'm like, I, "I'm cool with you talking to your ex, but you have to go on dates with six other women, and you have to videotape a personal a record on the bench press. <laughs> if you do those things." I completely am in favor of you talking to your ex and they'll do it. And then they'll talk to their ex and they'll get it. They'll get pissed off and like, Oh man, we got into another fight. That's fine. You can call her back, but guess what? You got to go on dates with six more girls and you got to show me another personal record on the bench press. By that time they're like, fuck this girl. Like I don't, yeah. I've been on dates with I'm 12 out. girls. I'm <laughs> out. I mean, I can bench press 345. I don't give a shit about this girl anymore. It's really funny. I want to get over my ex, date more girls. I want to get my ex back date more girls. I want to get better at dating, date more girls. It's like the answer is always abundance. Yeah, but it's also abundance in terms of like quality options. You don't yeah. want to just, like, if you break up with your girl and then you're hanging out with a bunch of, of lower quality um, people, then you're just not going to, you're not going to sort of satisfy that itch. Yeah. And you're going to compare all these girls to your past girl and they're not going to be as good. Whereas if you, you start hanging out with really, really high quality women, then you're like, wow, these girls are just as cool or even cooler than my ex. What was I doing? Let's keep moving forward. And if your guy was leveling up, that is what should be happening to you anyway. Yeah. I mean, I actually think if you had enough options, you might not even want to be in a relationship. It makes it tough. It makes it tough. Yeah. You know, like like me and a lot of a lot of the, the guys I run with, it's you know, we know that we can go around the world and just like kind of do whatever we want yeah. and, and, and have options in any city that we go to. So there's a there's a high opportunity cost for having a relationship, especially in your early thirties. No. It's it's a tough, it's a tough thing to do. Yeah, it's it's difficult, man. You fall in love with your business too. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and it's it's a it's a very much in contrast to what most guys feel like when they're in their early 30s. It's like, oh, I'm running out of time. I need to make something happen. It's like, man, we're just kind of coming into things right here. Exactly. Like, let's, let's roll. Listen, let's let's hit eight figures, and then we'll go ahead and have girlfriends. Yeah. Sound good? Yeah, let's yeah. Look, make that pack. There you go. Perfect. Um, so this is a, a big point of contention for me, and a lot of guys have a, an issue with this. So it's impossible for me to host these bikini competitions, babes in Toyland, to recruit for the Ignite parties, the Maxim parties, and not have female friends. I have a ton of fucking female friends. There's a huge point of contention in the red pill community because they're like, oh, you can't have female friends. And my whole thing is, no, you can't let women friends on you. That's a completely different thing. And we, use, I think we're using this, the wrong term for it. I have female teammates in my life who help me build, and so do you. I mean, you obviously have these girls on your, on your when they do the videos with yeah, you. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that? Where is the line of delineation or is there no line? Like I know some guys are like absolutely under, like you've seen the Steve Harvey thing where he's like, I cannot be friends with women under any circumstances. What, where do you draw the line there? I think you, you can definitely be friends with women. I've had great friendships with women as well. Yeah. And especially with what you're doing, you know, yeah. you're over here, you got the whole city unlocked, like we talked about. Yeah. You can't be, you know, you can't be banging 80, 80 bikini models at the same time. Can you imagine the, <laughs> the dynamic? First off, no, no bikini models being banged. My competitions, there's none of that. Yes, we are all pure. There's none of that. There's no, I know it's funny. I'll just make sure that's absolutely clear. Shout out to Swimsuit USA. None of that. All right, so... Uh, but yeah, then you're right. Like it's one of these, it's, it's a situation where I see these guys and they're just so adamant about this fact that you can't be friends with women. And I'm like, well, how am I supposed to be? Like they introduced me to more women. Of course I'm going to be friends with them. No, exactly, exactly. And, and there, there's, a, a, there's an aspect of just being a fun social guy. And yeah. You're bringing more people into your life. People understand you're a high value guy. You can you can push for something if you want, but if you don't want to as well, then then you understand that there's other value that women can bring in your life too. Like you can have great friendships. They can introduce you to other girls. Yeah. You know, and you can introduce them to your friends and get value that way. So there's there's plenty of value exchange outside of just being a girl that you hook up with. Yeah. I think the two parts where people get confused is number one, because I have female friends does not make me more woman like. This is a problem that a lot I think a lot of guys have is that they have a bunch of female friends and they start acting like women. I'm not I'm still when I hang out with my female friends, we go play basketball. I am not yeah. changing where you're gonna watch me play Madden. Like I'm not gonna change who I am or what I want to do because I'm hanging out with my female friends. But that's one of the first things. And the second thing is the guy who shoots a shot misses and then stays in in the friend zone to try to wait for the opportunity to pounce at some future point i am absolutely not in favor of that yeah no that's very much the wrong way to do it yeah. that's from just from the cute the questions i get from guys and, and i see things from students like that's the majority of guys who are in friendships with women that's what it's about yeah that's not where you want to be yeah but i do also think that there's it's great to have some great female friends but you also need to have that sort of dominant male crew with you too. Yes. That's going to keep you sharp. That's what, that's been one thing I've always tried to do no matter where I am in the world. And I try to orchestrate the places I go to based on this is always having a crew of guys who are crushing it. Basically just like a crew of just absolute savages who I know can, they can talk to women, they can crush it in business. And there's no way that I'm going to be able to be a slouch while being around these types of guys. So let's talk about this. As you level up, there's sometimes you have to leave some people behind. Right. They might say, hey, hey, you know, Dave, you've changed. I'm like, yeah, fuck yeah, but I've changed. Have you had that issue before? Well, the fun thing, like when I went to Vietnam, I made a, I made a ton of uh, friends who were entrepreneurs who were pushing themselves. And everyone was sort of at, like there were some guys at a higher level, but a lot of us were kind of on the come up. And the cool thing about me and a lot of my friends is we all kind of came up together at the same time. And so I didn't really have that many friends who were just kind of falling off. Mm, Everyone was okay. motivating each other. Because you, you, you moved. You moved somewhere else. You yeah. just completely up. Yeah. Not, yeah. Not, I had friends, even my friends from home were leveling up. To, I think that, that was just always, like I was always just, you know, sort of magnetized to guys who were pushing themselves, getting better. Even all my friends back in college, they all quit their regular jobs. They started businesses. So it just, it's always been, everyone's been kind of on the come up. And, uh, and now... We we sort of came up, and now we can go to Vegas and do you know have crazy parties and get tables and do all these different things and do it all together, and it's and it's a lot of fun. We can go down to Brazil and just like oh let's go move there for a few months, let's go, and everyone's kind of in it together. Not me, my friends from back home were selling crack and the <laughs> earth was flat. Like I, I I have a very different group back home. I had to I had to kind of change my game a little bit. No, that, that's definitely a group you get you get to cut off. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of those those types of friendships faded away for me back when I like you know early mid years of college. I still I still love them, but there's a, there's this issue that I heard. Um, I, Justin Waller had a great one. He was like, "I'm talking to a guy who can't pay his rent, and I have a one hundred thousand dollar payroll that I have to figure out how to make. I don't know how to talk to this guy. He can't pay his rent, and I have to figure out how to pay my crew 
one hundred thousand dollars this month. Yeah, you know? no, it's it's different. It's a different reality. Yeah, you're, like you're literally existing at a different different level, a different realm that you know the other guy is not going to even come close to being able to understand. Uh, do you read any Dr. Buss's books, D Gad Sad's books, any any evolutionary psychologist, Stephen Pinker? I've read some Stephen Pinker, but I haven't yeah. read uh, some of the other guys. You I, I recommend everything by Dr. Buss. Check them out. Every okay. book by Dr. Buss. It will like it, because what, what's going to happen? Two things are going to happen. There's going to be realizations that you didn't know that you're going to find super interesting and helpful. Number one, and number two, there's going to be things that you've been saying your whole life, but you didn't have the science to back it up, and now you do. So when you talk to somebody else about it, instead of saying this is my opinion, you're like this is a scientific survey with seventeen thousand anonymous participants. How, why Women Have Sex is one of the most enlightening books I've ever read in my entire life, bro. It's 17, I believe it's 17,000 women they survey on why they had sex, and it's anonymous. So these women are mostly honest, and they find out these incredible, incredible um, tendencies that women have. It's really great. And then the other books I recommend are Dataclism and Everybody Lies, because it goes over what people actually believe based on Google searches, not based on what self-reporting. People, okay. will, when they come out of, uh, if you were to, if you were to survey people coming out of a voting booth, they're going to give you answer X, and then you go in the voting booth, and it's a different answer because people don't want to say you know, publicly who they voted for. That's what, why I love those books that actually show the true intentions of human beings rather than what they, what they want you to believe. Does that make sense? Makes sense, yeah. I guess so I, that's why I love those books. And also, um, you know, Jealousy as an Evolutionary Adaptation. There's a book called The Murderer Next Door by Dr. David Buss. He talks about most murders are men killing other men over women because men are competitive. It's yeah. just these real things that you kind of understood, but you didn't understand why, and then you look at it from an evolutionary standpoint, and so much of it makes sense. Um, monogamy, do you think it is a natural state for humans, or do you think it's getting harder? Uh, not specifically for you and me, but like in general, do you think monogamy is, um, is, is sort of a construct we've built, or do you think it's something that's natural? I think it's definitely getting harder, mm -hmm. especially like we're like talking about with higher level guys, because they know that they have options. Mm. You know, higher level guys know that they have access to the top, you know, to the top women. And here's uh, the other problem. Not that only do they know they have top access to the top women, those women, when they're 23 and super hot, and by the way, that number's getting pushed later and later because of plastic surgery and, and face app or whatever. Those women also know they have options. So you have two groups of people that believe that they have incredible options and they, and they can never meet together on the marketplace. No, it makes it really, really difficult. At the same time, I do you know, understand the benefits of having a really, really deep connection with a great girl in your life too. Like I, I didn't fully understand that until I had that in my life for a long time. And, and being able to have that allowed me to grow, allowed me to grow my business, allowed me to have a lot more stability, which was really, really good. Uh, but it was still kind of gnawing at me having that monogamy it was it's it's tough it's a tough thing to kind of wrap your mind around i do feel like in some sort of a way it's it's a uh it's a it's a good challenge to face as a guy to kind of go through it and uh and i think for some people it works really really well for others maybe it doesn't work as well i'm still trying to figure out for myself sort of exactly how i want to handle that part of my life if mm. i want if i want to do something more monogamous or something more non-monogamous we'll see but uh yeah now there's a lot of different ways you can go uh, another thing I really liked you talked about it was spending five or six months to learn a skill. Uh, you, the whole thing where you leave the country, you go learn to copyright, you write a book, the copywriting and the writing of the book and the online coaching, which allowed you to travel the entire world, right? And you talked about, well, guys out there are asking you for advice, take five or six months to learn a skill. What are some of those skills? And then, and then where did you get that, that piece of advice from? Yeah, so I mean, in terms of that piece of advice, I think originally it came down to to uh, even a guy like Tim Ferriss in the four hour. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, just like that, having that idea of learning a skill. Some other friends back in back in the Boston days, they were trying to do that too, and then copywriting just made the most sense for me. I think right now, copywriting is still big. So is high ticket closing, and what high ticket closing is is hopping on call, hopping on video calls with potential clients for different types of businesses. And you're basically closing them. You know, you're basically selling. You know, digging into what's what's not working for them. How do you? And then and then from there, so, sort of laying off the pitch. You know, giving them the price and kind of going from there, right? And doing like a close, like having them. You know, you know, invest in the service. That is what high ticket closing is. And and anyone, you know, not not anyone can do it, but it's 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 learnable. It's learnable. I can't tell you how many bro. If you find a good one of those, pay them whatever. I can't look. Shout out to my sales team right now because these guys are fucking assassins they are I mean, you have to be an bro, assassin you bro, have to be an assassin set like 70 something percent close rate with, with with some of my guys they are monsters uh 
uh, so the, the, you have the uh, you have the paid and unpaid. You have the paid and organic, which lead you to a, a, a page, leads you down the sales funnel. You set up a call. Call sets you to a setter. Setter says, "Okay, this guy's got the money to buy the program. This guy doesn't have the money to buy the program. The guys who do have the money got, uh, to buy the program, they go to those high ticket closers that you're talking about right there, yeah. and they are worth." their weight in fucking gold. People are like, Michael, I wanna help your company. Uh, I need more uh, video editors. Man, I got video editors, bro. Uh, oh man, you know, I need, you need an assistant. I don't need an assistant, I'm good. I, got, I don't need an assistant. Hey Michael, I need, uh, you know, I can come be a photographer. Bro, I, I got photographers out the wazoo. It's like, you, if you are a fucking closer, that's what I need. I need closers. No, like I said, not, not everybody can do it. It's a really hard skill to learn. You know, it's yeah. one of the highest paid professions out there. So if you can get that down, then yeah, I mean, you, you can really do whatever you want. For and sure. There's plenty of ways to learn that, you know? Like, I mean, just, just from this podcast, we're talking about copywriting and closing. Those are two jobs that you can have living in Vietnam or living in Mexico City or living wherever. You don't need a college degree for it. You don't need a bunch of money to learn how to do it. And you can do it from home. Yeah. 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 No, and, and it's great. And I, it's, it's, I would say speaking of college, I would say college is just a complete scam at this yeah. point. Like it's probably this one point, of the biggest yeah. scams out there. Unless you're going to be a doctor, like, uh, you know. You have like, a trade. Yeah. Like a trade accountant, whatever it may be. Otherwise, if you're just going and you know studying liberal arts or communication, there's no point. There's no point in going and studying business. Just just go learn. You know, spend five six months learning a skill, building the business that way. You're gonna learn so much more. Go travel to a place like Vietnam where there's tons of entrepreneurs. Yes. Connect with them, and you're gonna have so much more success by the time you're you know you're 21, 22 than you would if you had a college degree. And like I, I've been hiring for years, I don't even look at people's resume. Like I I, I have a conversation with people. And that's how I do my hiring, because I can tell a lot just from having one conversation. Are there books that changed your paradigm in life? You mentioned uh, For Our Work Week. Are there any books that were like paradigm shifting for you? I would say, you know, it's kind of funny, and it's not, I wouldn't say it for the techniques, but the book The Game by Neil Strauss of course. was a great book because- The fact that that, that existed. Yeah, yeah. I read that back in like 2006, 2007. And what that showed me is that there is a lifestyle where you can travel around, you know, talk to girls and actually help other guys do this type of thing. And that sort of piqued my interest. And I didn't really envision myself ever being a dating coach still at that point. But it, it showed me that kind of lifestyle was possible. I'm like, all right, I need to figure out how to have that lifestyle. I'm going to figure it out. So that, that, in a lot of ways, that was that kind of planted the seed for me. You know what's funny? <coughs> what's f so funny is that the, the what's it called? The, the ethos, the environment has changed so much since that book was written. There's been tons of attempts to make uh, a screenplay and then make a movie about that book, right? That'd be a hard one to make nowadays. I, I, that's my point exactly. I know pretty much everyone who was living in that house. I know yeah. them, I've, or at least met them at one point or another. I've asked Neil about that house before. I met Neil at a Skrillex concert a long time ago. Uh, and um, it's one of these funny things where like, I'm real, I, you've been to the house before? I've been to the house several times. I haven't I, been to the I think house. they just tore it down recently Did or they something. Tore it down? Yeah, I think, huh? I think or they, they're building something else there. but. Uh, man, I remember when Vince Kelvin had that house, bro. I was like, what the fuck is this? What's going on right now? It was so crazy. The pillow pit, all that kind of stuff. Um, the thing about it is, uh, yeah, it's it's a really interesting thing, but because the ending of the story wasn't Hollywood enough, I don't know that they'll ever... They, know, might, they might have to change it a little bit. They might have they to change it a little it, bit. Yeah. yeah, it's really funny. Like it, the, ending, the ending of the movie is never the single guy gets rich and then stays single and has sex with lots of women. Yeah. Is, have you noticed that? Yeah. That is never the ending of the movie. The ending of the movie isn't like I have a buddy of mine. He was um, he's a professional gambler, and he was like, um, "Yeah, I want to do this movie for Netflix." I was like, "Bro, at the end of your movie, you just have millions of dollars and fuck lots of women. Do you think they're going to make a movie about you? They're never going to make a movie about this. Even the Wolf of Wall Street, he has to go to jail and learn a lesson, right? Yeah. We we all enjoyed the first part of the movie because he's fucking Margot Robbie. With the latter latter part of the movie, he gets caught, right? And we're just kind of like, oh, that was the lesson you learned. But does anyone remember that lesson? No, I'm not. I'm not fucking going. I'm not fucking leaving. I'm not, that's all we remember. That's all we give. Here's some money for some guac, bitch. Like we don't care. That's all we care about, right? Yeah. It's really funny how that works. But at the end, remember Up in the Air with uh, George Clooney? Do you remember that movie? At the end, he's like, he falls in love with the the woman who's married. I'm like, no, bro. What about the backpack? <laughs> what about all the traveling and the money? That was that part was awesome. Stick to that part. They, the movies never end that way. We have to learn our lesson that we need to be in a relationship, right? We need yeah. to have kids. We need to settle down. And it's funny. So our, that story never gets told. Yeah. It's probably one of the reasons why Andrew Tate blew up so big <laughs> is because no one was telling that story. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. Yeah, it, it, like, like Hollywood doesn't want you to just be that guy out there being a savage, yeah. being successful, doing, doing all those things. They don't yeah. want to know that that exists. Yeah, yeah. but no, or, or that it exists, but we're bad because yeah. it exists. And yeah. so therefore, at some point during the show, we need to learn a lesson. Yeah. 
We, we need, you need but, to be checked. By the way, I can't believe that movie that shows sex life. Did you see that show Sex Life on Netflix? I didn't see that. Basically, one, no. basically, she's married to one dude, and then there's this guy she used to date who's like super fucking handsome with a huge wiener, and he's like, <laughs> and she's like, oh god, I, all I can do is think about him. And I spoil it for you. I don't give a fuck. Uh, at the end, she's like. I love my husband. And then she's just like, fuck the shit out of me. Like the, she goes back to the other dude, the hot Australian guy. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is a real, I did not expect there to be this much honesty. And like, and women were just blown away. Like everyone Wait, so, loved so, the show. So, so the ending, she went back to the ex-boyfriend. Yeah. So at the, at the very end of the show, she decides I love my husband and I'm going to be with him forever. And they're like holding hands and they're with their children and they're very happy. And then the last like fucking 90 seconds of the show, she calls the dude and then he, the, the husband calls his, like, he's got like a side piece also. And then they, then he goes to the, 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 the side, the side boyfriend, the super handsome six foot five Australian guy. And she goes, this doesn't change anything with my, my, my uh, marriage. Oh man. Now I want you to fuck me. Wow. And that, that's the end of the show. That's the end of the season. And you're like, Oh fuck, bro. That's what's going on. I've never seen such an honest portrayal of what, what women want in this movie. I've never seen anything like this. And if it scares the shit out of you, good. Take a fucking program to imp improve yourself. That's what you should be learning from this, right? Exactly. There is no soulmate. Awesome, man. Uh, very cool. What else do you have coming up, man? So, so coming up, I'm just going to be bouncing around the world a little bit. Okay. Yeah, just traveling around, continuing to make fun Instagram videos, you know, getting different girls in there, doing interviews, all that type of stuff. Uh, I think right now I'm, I'm going to be going to Spain in a few weeks. Mm. Then uh, from there... Probably bouncing down either Brazil or Colombia, mm. and then just kind of trying. Right now, in the midst of trying to figure out my home base, so yeah, that's kind of like the next step for me. You know, where my next home base. We is We don't have be state at. income taxes here. Yeah, there's who knows? I, I am looking at Las Vegas as a potential. I know a lot of people out here. It seems like a good spot. There's so. a, there's a couple of cute girls here. I don't know if you're aware. I've heard. Yes. I've heard. I've seen them. There's there's a few. I like it here. Uh, awesome, man. Awesome. Very cool. And then uh, where can we find you on social media? Yeah, if you just go to Instagram at Dave uh, you'd be able to just you'd be able to find me. I post a new I post a new reel every single day, so you can go check those out. And uh, yeah, if you want to check out my coaching website, you go to beast-coaching.com. Are you editing those reels every day? Are you putting? Them I don't the edit graphics? the reels. I don't edit the reels. Yeah. I, I have a guy who edits it as a subtitles for me. Do it. Does all that. What, what do you film it on? I feel I just film it on my phone. I have like really? the iPhone so, 13 Plus, and and it it they have like a cinematic yes. mode. Which yeah, I really noticed really that. Good. So you've been yeah. doing with the blur. So it, it takes multiple. Are you are you using the backside camera? Uh, I don't even use the backside camera. I use, I use the front side camera. Really, and you're, and you're and you're so yeah. yeah. So it's taking it's 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 got this weird bokeh effect that happens where it's taking multiple lenses at the same time and it makes it look like it's got a low f stop. It's really cool effect. I love it. It makes all your photos look really cool. I, I knew right away as yeah. soon as I started doing reels and I was gonna do them every day. I needed to have like a more premium look to them. Yeah. I wanted the cinematic camera on the iPhone 13 Plus. Bro, we're getting to the point where we don't need these DSLRs anymore. Yeah. No, right? it's it's like the, the, the quality on these is just as good as my as my camera. Yeah. Was yeah. It's it's pretty amazing. So you're doing one a day? Do one every single And you're day. seeing massive growth from the reels from doing that. Yeah. 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 And, and, and even when the Instagram isn't, because the, the growth in terms of followers has slowed down. It yeah. slowed down a little bit after I hit 100,000. But still, like, the business is doing really well. Like, more and more trust is being built because people are constantly seeing me with new girls. They're constantly seeing me, you know, give good advice. Yeah. And they, you know, they, they build more and more trust over time. The leads will go through a link in bio, which will take you to a Hoobie or a link tree, which goes to your... Sales page, is that how it works? Yeah, it's like, it's like a beast. It's called like beast-coaching.com. And then okay. from there, we have all the testimonials, kind of the information about it. All and you, and you met, my number one metric that I tell everyone I work with is the leads going through my link to bio that go to my, my sales page. That's it. My entire business, to me, is that number right there. No, that important. number goes up, we're good. If that number goes down, some people might be getting fired. That's, yeah. that, that number is everything. Right, so that's that's really interesting, man. I, I really, really great talking to another entrepreneur about stuff like this. It's, it's very yeah. cool, awesome, man. Thank you, uh, big guys. Make sure you check him out. He's got some really great stuff. Really quick tips that I, I really enjoy. Thought that was great. Um, uh, you know, the three steps on how to do this, and like you really sucked me in. I'm like, well, oh, bro, what am I doing wrong? Did I not brush my teeth today? <laughs> oh, no. What can I do better? Did I not smile at her? Hold on, let me make sure I smile next time. Uh, that's pretty awesome. Hey guys, thank you so much. We got some more great guests coming up this week. Um, you know, talked to Tristan. Tate the other day. I'm still talking. Uh, me and Andrew, we, we're talking on a pretty regular basis. I got Rolo Tomasi coming in two days. I'm really excited, man. We're going to probably do a long one with him because there's so many things. I've read every single one of his books, so I'm excited to have him. Uh, Isabella James, man, I, she's a really great one. She actually coaches girls on their OnlyFans to help build their OnlyFans up. Uh, so she's she's coming on. And obviously, you guys saw uh, last week Alexandra Rose from uh, Selling the OC. We're probably going to have some more people uh, come on from there. Um, you know, shout out to the people from Unruly. Shout out to uh, Nikki Gathrate. We're, we're going to be working with them. We're going to be partnering with 
with them. Thank you to Shar Modell for building all these incredible um, social media, all this social media content. Grant and Miguel and Tristan and all the guys on my sales team, you guys have been killing it. I cannot possibly explain to you how awesome it is to be able to do this podcast to make a living from my coaching program, have this podcast. I don't have to look for sponsors because this podcast is for my clients and it's just been a really great way to tie this to revenue. And so I can just do whatever I want. I can talk about whatever I want. I can have whatever guests I want on. And, it, and as long as it's helping other people, that's the, that's the greatest part, man. I'm, a, I'm able to live a dream because of you guys. I want to say thank you and I will see you all next week. Thank <laughs> you.